Fran's been with Uber for almost a year and a half, and before that, she was a postdoc at Caltech developing novel approximate quantum dynamics theories for large biomolecules. I can't believe I didn't trip over that. She is cited in over 300 publications, has a PhD to her name, and is currently working as a data scientist at Uber. Akshay has been at Uber for nearly a year and spent most of that time working in data engineering. Before Uber, he worked as a full stack application developer at a handful of SF startups. And before that, he was a public school teacher. And before that, he was a doctor. <laughs> Fran and Akshay are here to talk about some things that will have a big impact on Uber SRE in the near future. So I'd like to give you, uh, you'd like you to give them a warm welcome. Thanks, man. Hey, so I'm Akshay, and this is not working. The green button, okay. It's so mystifying. Anyways, so I'm Akshay. I've been here for about a year, and I want to talk to you engineer to engineer as a toolsmith. So I've been on call for all kinds of things, from servers to ambulances, and at 2 in the morning when you get paged, what you want are really nice, sharp tools to help you figure out what the heck is going wrong and how you can fix it. In my year at Uber, I think I've seen this company reinvent its whole observability stack from logging to app telemetry to monitoring. And I want to talk to you in a little bit of detail about exactly what we've built, why, and what we think it's buying us. So, as everyone's told you, Uber right now is about 1,000 microservices in four data centers around the world. And those 1,000 microservices produce 500 million distinct telemetry time series. So that's like request per second to this endpoint, P99 latency over here, count of some random error condition in some random service. Those 500 million time series are 3 million writes per second and about 1,000 reads per second. And in terms of storage capacity, we're looking at 500 gigs of compressed time series data every day. Now, if you're a pre-Series A startup hacking away on your Rails monolith, that's a ton. If you're Google, that's maybe not very much. But no matter who you are, it's growing at 25% month over month, which is bonkers. So if we rewind this story to the end of 2014, which is a little bit before I started here, we were using the same open source monitoring tools that everybody else uses and that I've used in my past jobs. And everything was on fire. Services emitted metrics with stats D and carbon. All of that got shoved into graphite whisper files. We were using Grafana for charting and Nagios for monitoring. It's all a pretty familiar story, but nothing really worked. And it was pretty embarrassing. Like if you look over on the right, those are actual screenshots from the actual Uber app saying things like 403 forbidden or malformed request. And just like a lot of our systems, we kind of took a long, hard look at this and realized that it was time for our monitoring system to grow up and scale with the business. So if you're like me, you might stop me there and just say, why not just cut the problem down a little bit? Like, how are your 1,000 services producing 500 million time series? That's insane. And I tell you that while that's a reasonable intuition, Uber is a pretty unique business. We're not actually one business. We're a couple of hundred tiny local businesses run across the world. Every city has its own promotions, its own ops team, its own policies, its own regulatory environment. And so monitoring to make sure that trips are happening in Cape Town does not guarantee you that Uber Eats is up and running in San Francisco. All through our stack, we monitor every city individually. The second thing, and apologize to the guys from Amazon, um, we don't have any free users. Um, that's pretty unusual at tech companies of our scale. Nobody just opens the Uber app to like browse around and see if there's a Benz driving nearby. You open the app when you're ready to take a trip and you're ready to spend some money. And if we can't serve that request, you'll open another app and take a different ride. So for, as a, for us as a monitoring team, that means that we want to make it as easy as possible for service owners to track everything they think they might need to diagnose an outage. So it's 2014. Everything's on fire. We don't want to put in some really heavy-handed quota system. So what do we do? Well, 
we decided we were going to build our own time series database from scratch. Well, not totally from scratch, but kind of from scratch. Um, the core technologies we use are Cassandra for storing the raw data and Elasticsearch for secondary indexing. The whole app tier is written in Go. And the cool thing to me is that the back end of that system, the ingestion layer, is backwards compatible with StatsD and Carbon, our legacy technologies. And the front side is API compatible with Graphite. So to most of the thousand-ish working engineers here, they didn't even know that this was happening. Um, we rebuilt this system, shoved in this new database where the old one used to be, and the business just kept going. Obviously, we've had our growing pains with Go, Cassandra, and Elasticsearch. But in general, this means today telemetry is growing with the rest of the business. If you're a reasonable person, you're going to ask why we're building this in-house and why we're not using something open source and off the shelf. I had the same question. Come talk to me afterwards. They're like, we did a long vetting process of all those open source projects on the right and tons of other stuff. Um, and for a variety of reasons, none of them quite fit our needs. If you have really detailed questions, talk to Jay in the back. He worked on this system. So we've rebuilt the time series database. You can store data reliably. And of course, you solve one problem, and the next one just crops up. So the next problem is that once you have the, oh, wrong button. Once you have the data, you want to write an alert, right? Because you don't want to be staring at dashboards all day. You want something to page you. Well, Uber's historic alerting system was Python scripts checked into every service. So you can see here that here's an example of kind of a moderately complicated alert. It's just a Python script. It gets cloned onto one box and run every minute. And some things about it are really nice. Like it's super flexible because this query is just a string that gets shoved at the time series database. So you can write an arbitrarily complex query to express exactly what it means for your application to be healthy. Um, the downside is that it's super flexible. And so occasionally someone gets really ambitious and their monitoring process like forks off 20 threads or like decides it wants to be adventurous and cache some state on the local file system. And we decided we wanted something that was maybe a little bit less flexible and user friendly. So we built uMonitor, a web front end to our monitoring service. It retains the query flexibility. So you can see here that your app's query is still just a big blob of text. But it gives you a couple of nice things. It lets you back test your thresholds against old data. So you can say, for this query with a threshold of 10, how many times would I have been paged in the last month? And is that something I can live with? And it gives you pluggable outputs. So maybe for something that's not super important, you'll get emailed. For something that's mission critical, you'll get paged in the middle of the night. It's extensible enough that we can write new actions for the system to take, like maybe automated rollbacks or evacuating a data center or what have you. However, at this point, we had gotten to the place where we thought we were going to feel kind of done. Like the time series database is built, alerting is nice and user friendly. And this is about when we started to realize that these threshold-based alerts were not quite good enough to monitor our business. And that kicked off a pretty long data science project, which Fran's going to tell you all about. Thanks, Akshay. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Fran. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our project around building um, intelligent real-time monitoring algorithms here at Uber. And let me first delve into why static thresholds, which is what we were using prior to this project, are just not sufficiently good enough to be tracking these kind of metrics. So first of all, we have just a very, very large number of these metrics. As actually I said, we have about 500 million of these time series currently. So if you want to track only 1% of those, that's still 5 million. And so if you want to set even static thresholds, that means that you have to hand configure rather subjectively 5 million of these time series. Now Uber grows at 25% month over month, and that means you would have to have a whole army of people uh, resetting these thresholds uh, if any of your metrics are actually demand driven. And furthermore, um, as actually was saying, we actually want to monitor city by city. 
And this means that a lot of our metrics are demand driven and have a 24 hour and seven day cycle to them. And so as you can uh, very easily see, something that's static and would just be a threshold that wouldn't uh, change over time would be something that would not be fitting such a curve very well. So you have like two options if you wanted to do static thresholds. Either you set your thresholds in a way that you might be able to catch small variations in the low demand areas and you would be woken up every Saturday night when peak traffic kicks in. Or you set them really, really broad and then the whole house might be on fire before you even get an alert in the first place. Right? In addition, we had a very poor user experience surrounding these alerts. So it was very hard to actually go in, identify what was the root cause of these alerts once you get alerted, what was the issue. And so we went away and uh, built a whole platform surrounding this that would be able to deal with demand-driven metrics, with metrics that are growing extremely rapidly. And what we wanted to build is a system that is fully automated. The only real thing that our users had to give us is a list of business critical metrics and the rest was completely done automatically and is maintained completely automatically. This includes uh, underlying growth, this includes rollout, so for example for canaries which is very important for us to have monitoring surrounding app version rollouts etc. This includes seasonality such as 24 hours or 7 day cycles. And also this algorithm is extremely computationally efficient. So we built something that is embarrassingly parallel so it can scale out very easily and can be applied to hundreds of thousands of time series. And finally, we in integrated all of this with the Grafana dashboarding that we have. And we're also building currently a completely automated root cause analysis, which will guide our SREs and on-call engineers to the right uh, point where they should be looking and delving into the problem further. So let me show you some of the outputs um, of this algorithm. And this algorithm also importantly can cope with things like high demand scenarios. So for example, if there's Beyonce concert finishing it uh, in LA somewhere, we're not gonna wake up our on-call engineers at the other side of the world. So here in red and in yellow, you can see the upper and lower dynamic thresholds that we're completely automatically generating. And for visualization purposes, I've also included in blue the actual metric counts. Um, and this, of course, is filled in after the fact. So the algorithm knows exactly where this metro metric should be going in the next couple of hours and can adjust to this dynamically. And very important, something that static thresholds could never do that dynamic thresholds can capture is scenarios such as this, where, for example, the maximum of the lower threshold actually exceeds the minimum of the upper threshold. And finally, I would like to show you a, a real example of an outage that we detected with our system. And as you can see, if we were to use static thresholds for this metric here, we would not have caught this outage very fast or even at all, because this metric has as many cities a day and night cycle to it. And if we were to set a static threshold, it would be somewhere around this minimum baseline here. However, our system was able to find this in less than a couple of minutes, as indicated here by this red dot. And we have really broken ground here with our algorithms in the sense that we have not missed a single outage for any metric that was onboarded with our system. And at the same time, we have accomplished 80% actionability. That means eight out of 10 of the alerts you're getting are actually indicative of a true issue. With this, I want to give back the mic to Akshay, who will be talking a little bit about the implementation. Cool, so we have this algorithm. It's pretty awesome, but it's ne it needs to get into production and it needs to run with a reliability that exceeds the rest of the system, as you'd expect from a monitoring product. So these are actual screenshots from our Grafana installation. Um, this is kind of a typical thing that a service owner tracks at Uber. It has that typical daily period. It's kind of noisy. It's got that random half trough over on the side over there. 
And this is your day-to-day -day as an engineer. Your job is to monitor that thing and make sure it doesn't go sideways. So what we did is we built another service called F3, which periodically queries the time series database, grabs a selection of historical data, and uses that data to calculate a dynamic threshold that's good for tens of minutes. And rather than forcing users to deal with yet another system that needs to be configured and where you have to learn all of its weird quirks, we decided to centralize on Grafana for exploration. So all those dynamically generated thresholds are saved to Cassandra, and you can query them and view them in Grafana just like anything else. So here's the exact same data in green with our actual production thresholds in blue and yellow above and below it. So like, that's kind of cool. It's a nice picture. As a working engineer, though, this still doesn't really help me that much, right? It's, it's a nice picture, but how do I write a monitoring query to wake me up for this? Well, we decided to take things up another level in abstraction and write a little function called anomalies that sits in the time series query layer, and it takes as input your metric. So if stats.foo is the raw count there in green, you wrap it in a call to anomalies, and anomalies uses these dynamic thresholds and a variety of other information to translate your raw count into a one to 10 scale of how worried you should be. Um, zero is stone cold normal, 10 is the house is on fire and you should totally already be awake, and the magic line in the sand is four. So that means that as an engineer, you're tracking, say, the number of requests to your favorite endpoint, your Nagios query is basically anomalies wrapped around the number of requests. And like, this is pretty cool when your metric is really simple, like stats.foo. But that's not really typical. What's more typical is something kind of like what's in the upper right here. This is a fairly realistic query that is trying to identify the 10 most anomalous machines that are running a particular service. And you can see it's kind of a mess. There's all this nested function calls, there's a ton of repetition. That little like sum fill nulls dance is super common here. There's usually some like moving averages and some week over week stuff sprinkled in there too. It's just this black art of writing good queries. What we're in the process of rolling out now is a new query language and a new Grafana plugin built in-house that reimagines this infix style notation as something a little more Unix-y. So you start with a bag of data that you fetch from the database, and then you pass it through successive refinements, a lot like sort of normal Unix shell scripting where you pipe your textual data from one small program to another. And it's computer, so everything old is new again. And in that world, anomalies looks pretty normal. It's just another small program in this pipeline that you'd run at a command line. And this kind of brings us up to today. Um, end of 2014, everything's on fire. End of 2015, we have a new time series database that's fully rolled out, a new monitoring kind of config front end that's mostly rolled out, we have anomaly detection available to everyone in production, and we have this new query language that's kind of half rolled out and still a work in progress. What's next for us in observability? Um, the first bag of projects are all about getting more context and more data when you're on call. So we want really good cross-language dapper style tracing. We want business context for all of our engineering metrics. So I want to know that my servers are melting in San Francisco because it's the Super Bowl. And I want to know that dispatch is still working, it's just nobody's taking a trip because all of DC is under three feet of snow. And then we want to build a system that collates all of that data and surfaces just the bits that are most important to you to figure out the root cause of evolving incidents. On the other end of things, we know that we're never going to hit our reliability goals 
if it takes a human to get woken up and hit a button to fix things. So we want all of our systems to support automated remediation. That means that in the ideal world, you wake up in the morning to an email that says, hey, I noticed that your server was anomalously under load at midnight. And 12 seconds later, I expanded the cluster and promoted a new database master for you. So you didn't even get paged. This is just an FYI so you know what changed overnight. And that's kind of the story we're trying to build here. Um, if that's exciting to you, come talk to me after.